All right, it's wonderful to be back in Florida. I don't know how many conferences I've attended here in Florida. Um, five, six, seven, eight, I don't really know. It's been very, been quite a few. I have to apologize that I have to leave shortly after my lecture. Um, it's actually kind of an emotional day for me. I just got a text from my wife. If you don't know, the Junior National Swimming Championship Cup is going on this week at, um, in Clearwater, Florida. And my son uh, just placed second in the preliminaries in the 50 backstroke, setting a time that would have been a world record in 2000. Not for his age group, it would have been a world record. So I'm very, very happy with that. And, uh, Three point four seconds and fifty meters. That's really fast. Any event, um, I'm delighted to be here to celebrate, help celebrate Krishna's birthday. Um, it's actually interesting for me to, to 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 begin this lecture this way because for many of these meetings at Florida, I felt like the junior mathematician. But over time, that doesn't begin to apply so well. And it's kind of with mixed emotions that, you know, my two children will be in college next year. And I think I first, my first Florida meeting was, I was a, I was a newlywed, you know, maybe 24 years ago. It's crazy how, how quickly time goes by. So it's really appropriate for me to, to, to wish Krishna a happy birthday because well, as many of you will enjoy tomorrow, you're going to see this film called The Man Who Knew Infinity. All of us love Ramanujan. And as you know, Krishna is one of the main supporters for the movement that is helping to make Ramanujan a household name now. And what we learn in Ramanujan, in fact, there's an op-ed piece that I wrote with Robert Schneider that will be published soon. We learn a lot of things about Ramanujan, but two of the things that we definitely learn about Ramanujan is that if you have dreams, you can overcome impossible circumstances which are seemingly impossible. The reason I'm bringing that up now is not because I want to promote the movie or this book, by the way, that I wrote that's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really saying it for the students because I first met Krishna as a graduate student at UCLA. And for those of you who may eventually get this book, you will learn that I had a very difficult time in high school. I had a very difficult time in college. And um, it's, you know, 25 years ago after at my first Florida conference, if you told me that I would still be in math having something to talk about, I would have thought you were crazy. I had plans to do all sorts of different things. I thought I had no career. One of the things that we learned from Ramanujan is he had dreams, but he had help. This film that you're going to see is really a film about Ramanujan from Hardy's perspective. Hardy was a person who offered Ramanujan help, and honestly, had that not happened, none of us would be here, perhaps, enjoying this conference this way. And, uh, well, I thank Krishna because, well, he's built this group in Florida. He's been great to so many young mathematicians. You, you've heard from lots of the Ramanujan Sastra Prize winners. And if you're a graduate student, these are people you look up to. Maybe Krishna and I, maybe I'm old enough to say I, they look young to me. So I wish I was still, you know, in my 20s and 30s. But for all of us, um, there were very difficult times. And uh, without Krishna, and without these meetings to look forward to, where would the help have been for us? And where would that sense of community have been? So I know that Krishna and Frank and, and Alex and others here have gone to great lengths to having great lectures, but also assembling a schedule full of social activities. We, we heard this incredible concert last night. Chris, uh, you know, Christian Krattenthaler is a lovely pianist. I mean, this is how community is built. So if you're a student, not sure what your role is going to be in mathematics, or if you're a postdoc thinking the same things, I assure you 25 years ago, I didn't think I had a chance. So if, if you remember one thing from this conference, it's, well, that's what conferences are about. Help, mentoring, and um, there's a movie, go see it, spread the word. And there's something about a book that I wrote where a lot of my life is going to be no longer quite secret and I'm a little bit petrified about what that will end up meaning for me moving forward. But I think the message is important. Um, great. So thank you, Krishna.
Great, so my lecture today um, is about recent work with lots of people in the room, uh, and since I'm a little bit late, I'll just mention them as, as the work comes up, and it's uh, work that I'm very excited about. So I'm going to be give a 30 minute just snapshot of what we've done, and it's, it's surprising that some of the theorems that we've been proving are related to questions that probably could have been answered a long time ago. So please don't think about anything I'm talking today about as being the result of a technical advance in mathematics, unlike a lot of what we've heard in terms of the theorems on prime numbers. If, if you're a graduate student and you're wondering why we're hearing so much about primes at this conference, it's because you happen to be a graduate student at a particular point in time where major advances have been made. So today I want to talk about the Riemann hypothesis and a conjecture of Manning for modular forms. And to explain where Manning is coming from, I can just begin with the zeta function. Riemann's zeta function is here. You all know it. And you know it has a functional equation. It has a celebrated Riemann hypothesis that is often used as, um, a, as a heuristic or as a hypothesis that allows you to prove theorems. That's why the Riemann hypothesis is important. There are some ex examples of Riemann hypotheses which have been proven, also equally important, and I hope today's lecture will give you one more proven Riemann hypothesis, and I hope to explain why, why it's important. But it's, before I get to that, let me also highlight one of my favorite formulas involving the zeta function. One of my favorite formulas involving the zeta function is this generating function for Bernoulli numbers. I rewrote it this way. It's the statement that the value of the zeta function at negative integers has this beautiful expression as this function, this power series in t, t divided by 1 minus e to the minus t. That means a lot to us. The numerator means something called periods, and the denominator really encodes something called the weight. It's a little bit invisible, but I'll explain to you what I mean by that. So, um, so these are two, two slides. And if you work in algebraic K theory, it wasn't that long ago where this very power series was revisited as studying portion and K groups for Q as a prototype for um, a lot of the work on uh, Bloch, Kato, Suslin, and many others. Okay. So over the last couple of years, Yuri Manin, who is really a brilliant mathematician, he's a visionary, almost everything he envisions be becomes a theory, he's been promoting what he calls a theory of zeta polynomials. And, and here's his definition. A polynomial in S, Z of S, should be a zeta polynomial if it satisfies a number of conditions. One, it should be reasonable in origin. So it should be arithmetic geometric in origin. It should satisfy a functional equation. Z of S should be related to its value of 1 minus S, exactly like the, just like the zeta function. And it should satisfy the Riemann hypothesis. This polynomial with finitely many zeros, if rho is such as zero, it should have real part equal to a half. And, well, just like an Euler generating function for the Bernoulli numbers, the values of these polynomials in, at, at the negative integer should be arithmetic in content, something like k groups over q. And they should also have a nice generating function which reveals the theory of the functions that underlie uh, the subject. And in some of the papers he, he, he has written, he has given a number of examples. And the example that I want to relate to uh, is, can basically be paraphrased as follows. Uh, in this recent paper, he doesn't state this as a conjecture, but this is a, certainly what he means. Manning conjectures that there should be a theory of zeta polynomials associated to periods of modular forms. So in the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture, we're interested in the value of the L function for an elliptic curve around S equals 1. That's like one of the periods, and for modular forms, there will be a collection of numbers like that, and those are what we call the periods, and I'll make that a little bit more precise in a moment. So the main theorem for today is that this conjecture is true. I'm going to offer you the theory of zeta polynomials for modular forms, and some of its applications, there are connections to Earhart polynomials, there are connections to the block kato conjecture, and so it is probably a very reasonable expectation that moving forward, um, that some of the polynomials I'm studying here I think will be of interest to, uh, I think, a wider audience. So the fundamental theorem I want to start with to prove this conjecture is, well, first I have to construct for you what the polynomial is and then prove those conditions. So it's not very easy to construct polynomials out of a hat that satisfies this, and that's really Manin's point. 
Uh, so let me explain to you how we do this. So it begins with the, the fundamental theorem of L functions for modular forms. I've, I've left out names, but uh, for, for experts, you know them. For non-experts, let's just call this the fundamental theorem. If F is a weight K cusp form, it's a new form, modular form, which is primitive, then the following are true. This every modular form of this type has an analytic continuation. It satisfies a functional equation of this sort. So lambda f of s is what we call the completed L function. It's, it's the L function that you obtain by multiplying by the gamma function gamma of s times this component coming from the level. And there is a functional equation, a sign of the functional equation, plus or minus, for which the completed L function satisfies this nice functional equation. And um, what's, what, what are the numbers that we're interested in? Well, for the integers between 1 and k minus 1, j, the special value of f, this L function at f at j, is going to be an algebraic number times some power of pi times one of two possible periods. So to every modular form, there are periods. For a generic high weight, even weight, high even weight modular forms, there are two periods. And the sources of transcendence in these values are, are in the period and the powers of pi. So if you're interested in Birch and Swinnerton Dyer, for example, when the weight is 2, there's one critical value. If k is 2, there's one value. And this should be really the period that comes from the modular form. And the number that's here in Q-bar is essentially going to be things like orders of the shock rate of state group, Tamagawa number, so on and so forth. And people work very, very hard interpreting this line. And a lot of open questions in, in number three relate to just those numbers. So what I want to focus on are precisely those numbers. Uh, yesterday, Pavel told me I forgot to include Deline. That's a particularly bad omission. So it says Deline there. You just can't see it. <laughs> so for every weight k new form, the critical values will be the set of numbers lf1, lf2 through lfk minus 1. And what Manin was saying is that there should be a way of constructing a theory of zeta polynomials from this collection of numbers, because these numbers we know in number theory are important. So let me begin by just giving you the definition of what we will offer as the correct zeta polynomial. So it won't come as a surprise. Whenever you have a finite collection of data that you want to study, you study its moments. So from these k minus 1 critical values, I want to study the moments of the completed L function. So we're summing up the completed L function evaluated at, j, at, at these critical points, multiplied by the m powers of j, weighted in this way. So these are what I'm going to call the weighted m moments of these k minus 1 critical values, these are just numbers. And the zeta polynomials we want to define are as follows. They're polynomials in S, a degree k minus 2, and they, have, they are these particular weightings of those moments that I just explained to you. What are the numbers S? The numbers S are numbers that you'll, will come up later, or, or at least implicitly later in many of the talks on the Q series. These, these numbers S are the sine Stirling numbers of the first kind, and they're the coefficients of the polynomial x which are given by uh, this, uh, well, these polynomials on x. These are, you're going to see things like q, q infinity, q sub n, uh, probably maybe starting this afternoon. And if you're working that subject, these are numbers that you would know very well. well what is our theorem? And by the way, there, as you would expect, there's lots of very interesting properties related to these numbers that are of combinatorial interest. What is our theorem? So for every new form, we, we have that that polynomial that I just defined for you satisfies a functional equation. What is epsilon of f? That's exactly the sign of the functional equation that the L functions satisfy. So if z at s is related to its values at 1 minus s. And it satisfies the Riemann hypothesis. If rho is a 0 of this polynomial, then its real part must be 1 half. So for every modular form, I'm offering you a polynomial that satisfies the Riemann hypothesis, and it comes from the moments of the uh, critical values. So those are, so to say that we um, that I'm offering you uh, Manning's theory of zeta polynomials for every modular form, I, I've only done half of it in this theorem. What I have to do is offer you the rest. So I also have to show you that the values of these polynomials at negative integers, they are arithmetic, 
and they also have a nice generating function, something that's analogous to what Euler offers you in terms of Bernoulli numbers. Before I do that, uh, let me just offer you an example for the delta function, the weight 12 cusp form. You can have your computer compute these critical values. You can compute the moments, and numerically you'll find that this polynomial has, is a polynomial of degree 10 that has coefficients that look like this. All of those coefficients are transcendental. I'll, I'll interpret them in a moment. And if you do a numerical approximation on the zeros, well, you get these red bullet points, and you can see they do lie on the real line, real part of S equals half. We proved that. So the Riemann hypothesis is true for all of these modular forms. But I just wanted to give you an example of a picture. OK. So what is this nice generating function? Well, the nice generating function requires a slight renormalization. So for every modular form f, every new form f, I'm going to slightly renormalize it. Re renormalize what's called the period polynomial in this way. So this, is, this can be thought of as a generating function for the critical values. So j is moving, the critical values are moving. This is a polynomial in z. And the theorem is that this generating function for the critical values divided by 1 minus z raised to the k minus 1 is a power series in z. Well, what power series in z is it? It's the one that has the values of our zeta polynomials at negative integers in order. So this is like t over 1 minus e to the minus t. Great. All right. And I just wanted to point out that this looks like this, and there are lots of heuristics that go back and forth between why these, these have similar meaning. Great. So this theorem and, and the previous theorem together can allow us to conclude that these periods do indeed explain um, uh, most of what Manin was asking for in, in, his, in, his, in his examples. Where is the arithmetic geometric content? Well, this is, this is just absolutely free. It's free because um, arithmetic geometers have been studying critical values of L functions for a long time. We have robust conjectures about what these values should be. So the critical values of these L functions should be related to orders of Schaffer H state groups. We renormalize them in this way using these numbers C. And it's an immediate corollary that if you assume the truth of the block Cato conjecture, then the m power moments of these critical values are power moments of these numbers. And you can envision studying the Galois representations associated to a complex um, which is layered by making use of these Stirling numbers. I'm not going to go much into that because it's really not very complicated, but I just want to say at the first level, you have the ordinary block Cotlow conjecture. And as you walk up that generating function, you're getting this complicated simplex um, uh, of direct products of Galois representations and raised powers. So it turns out that these polynomials have more properties than just the theorems that I've described to you. So let me tell you about some of their limiting values. So uh, as is customary, I'm going to let the binomial coefficient x choose y, or x and y are complex, be this ratio of gamma functions. And what do I want to do? I want to study, independent of the level, two infinite families of polynomials. So for every even integer k beginning at 4, I'm going to study these two polynomials, hk plus and h minus k, of these, and, and they're all polynomials in S. Okay. And what's, what's, what's special about these polynomials is this. Well, if suppose that k is at least 4, this is really a corollary of earlier work that I'm about to describe in a moment. Suppose that k is at least 4 and epsilon is plus or minus 1, then the limit of these, poly these zeta polynomials normalized suitably, both normalized to have leading coefficient 1, these zeta polynomials for the modular forms converge to, well, converge to these polynomials that arise from these binomial coefficients. What are we taking the limit over? We're taking the limit over n, so we're considering the congruent subgroups gamma 0 n, where n is going to infinity, and we're choosing f randomly from spaces s, k, gamma 0, n, where the sign of the functional equation is either plus or minus. So that's what the, that's what the epsilon is. So what this tells you is that in the limit, these zeta polynomials are converging to these binomial sums. These binomial sums are things that automatically come for free when you study L functions. They really come from the structure of the completed L function. 
So this is a, this is a special case of a more general phenomenon, uh, which others uh, will be exploring if you want to consider higher dimensional L functions, other motivic L functions, so on and so forth. And what does that lead to? It leads to an unexpected connection for us uh, to Earhart polynomials. And let me just give one special case of that. Uh, Earhart polynomial is something that's new to me. I've only been vaguely aware of, 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 of the theory, so I apologize if I say something that advertises my ignorance. So given a d-dimensional integral lattice polytope in Rn, an Earhart polynomial for it, L for a polytope P, for Earhart polynomial, Polytope. Erhard polynomial LP of x is the polynomial whose special values encode the number of lattice, lattice points in its, in its scales. And, well, it's very nice because it turns out that the polynomials which correspond to the sine of functional equation minus are Erhard polynomials for this simplex. So capital P is your lattice polytope, right? Yes, yes. So here's a special case of the sine of the functional equation minus the weight 6. Larry Rowan made this beautiful picture. You have this tetrahedral lattice polytope. What is the theorem saying? The theorem says that if you consider all weight 6 new forms, the sine of the functional equation is minus, let the levels tend to infinity, the zeta polynomials converge to this. I think it's a beautiful statement. So it tells you something about the ratio between periods and how they correspond to um, counting number of uh, lattice points inside scaling polytopes. So this actually must be something interesting going on there. So how does all of this work? It actually works because um, there's some beautiful work of Fernando Rodriguez Villegas from many years ago, which was initially set up, I think, to prove the theorems that I'm telling you about. Okay, thank you. I think we're proving the theorems that they knew were going to exist. So suppose that u is a real polynomial of degree e, which doesn't vanish at 1. And, well, then there's a polynomial h, for which u divided by 1 minus e raised to the e is just a generating function for h to value with integers. And what's really important about this isn't that that's an elementary exercise. What's important about this is if all the roots of u lie on the unit disk, then it turns out that all the roots of Z, which is defined to be h of minus s, y on the real part of s equals a half. But even better than that, it turns out this polynomial z also satisfies the functional equation of the type that you expect for the zeta function. So in a short paper in the proceedings of the AMS, Fernando wrote this. And as I understand it, this was uh, all in the direction of studying the theory of periods. So, the, so he was working towards the theorems that I'm describing to you now, theorems 1 and 2. Uh, so, to illustrate how simple it is, to sketch the proof of theorem 1 or 2, we first had to show that the polynomial, normalized period polynomial, have, has all of its roots on the unit disk. If we prove that, and then make a definition between the polynomial h in the previous slide compatible with the definition I gave you for z, then we would have proven those two theorems. So, let me spare you the combinatorics. Um, uh, let me explain this, and uh, that's where most of this work is. That statement is what's referred to as the Riemann hypothesis for period polynomials, and let me just briefly explain uh, some of that. And, and, and well, let's start. So, so period polynomials are usually described in this way. If f is a new form, its period polynomial is usually viewed as the generating function for the critical L values in order. And so let me give you an example of that. If you consider the, weight, the unique weight for new form of level eight, you get these three critical values. There's k minus one critical values for weight k forms. If you write down as polynomial, it looks like this. It's a quadratic, use a quadratic equation, and you'll find its roots are these two numbers. And if you square their norms, you get a number that looks like this, which looks a whole lot like one eight. So from these crazy numbers, you arrive at one eight. And that 8 looks a whole lot like that white 8. The red and white 8 are the same 8. What is the conjecture of the Riemann hypothesis? It's supposed that f is a new form with weight at least 4. If you're wondering what happens at weight equals 2, there's no polynomial, so there are no zeros to consider anyway. So the theory starts here at 4. 
And the conjecture is that if r vanishes at a point z, then z lies on a disk of radius 1 over root m. Okay. So uh, people have been trying to prove this recently. Uh, Connery, Farmer, and Imamoglu proved the odd part of this for level 1. My student El Gindi and Sam Raj, Raji, it's his birthday today, I think, proved n equals 1 case. And in joint work with Sako Jin, Wenjun, Ma, and Sound, I think everyone's in the room, we've proven that the Freeman hypothesis is true in general. And in particular, um, there are a number of theorems of this sort, but one, one theorem would be for a fixed group gamma zero n, as the weights go to infinity, the zeros become equal distributed on the unit circle, the circle of radius one over root n. And well, that's actually a special case of a, a, a much stronger theorem, we, we can locate for you where these zeros are. So if, F, if either the level or the weight is large, then the roots of the period polynomial are given by this expression. What are the theta L's? They are angles. They are angles that are roots to these equations depending on the choice of the functional equation. All right. And what's the point? The point is as k goes to infinity, this goes, right, well, well, anyway, this is the, here are the zeros. I'm just worried it's 1228. So what's the general strategy for proving the Riemann hypothesis for period polynomials? Is to use it's well, there's really two parts. I'm only going to say a few things. The first thing is to recognize that by the theory of L functions, the right way to write down the period polynomial is by means of an integral. What do we know? We know that new forms are of course, modular, so we know about their behavior under, under atkin lehner involutions. And what that offers us is a functional equation for, for these period polynomials. So we do a slight change of variables and arrive at this polynomial P. This, functions, this function satisfies this functional equation relating its values at x and 1 over nx. Why do, why do we refer to the Riemann hypothesis of period polynomials as a Riemann hypothesis? Well, the circle of symmetry for a functional equation relating x and 1 over nx is a circle with radius 1 over root n. So what's the general strategy? The general strategy is to break up this polynomial in two parts, keeping in mind that it already satisfies this functional equation. So you kind of only need to know half of it. So here is half of it called capital P. m is k minus 2 over 2. And so theorem 4 will follow if we can show this polynomial T has all of its zeros on the unit circle. We're just changing variables to uniform ones. And we're very lucky, uh, not when we started. Uh, when we started, we didn't have sound. We were doing other things. Um, but in the end, we're very lucky. It turns out this polynomial, in most cases, can be studied by, use, by using very, very old, famous theorems. I like that. You don't have to work hard. So if you let x go to z, which is e to the i theta, it turns out that you can interpret this polynomial, of course, the trigonometric polynomial in sine or cosine, depending on whether epsilon is plus or minus 1. And there's an old theorem of Zago going back to the 30s that suppose, says that suppose u and v are such polynomials. And if the coefficients of these polynomials satisfy these inequalities, then both u and v have exactly n zeros in this interval, and these zeros are simple. And if you just count the zeros, then, uh, well, kind of just get the theorems. Wonderful. So what this allows us to do is to replace, replace, the, replace what we thought we were supposed to be doing in proving these theorems, which started out as a complicated version of Rouchet's argument, okay, Rouchet's theorem, uh, with the task of proving certain inequalities for completed L functions. So the completed L function, lambda of fs, satisfies these conditions. Okay. And if you remember, just very briefly, we needed to come up with these conditions. And so, uh, how do you, and, all right, and here's another lemma which we need, which is essentially Deligne's theorem in disguise. And what, the, what is the point? The point is that if you prove these lemmas, which follows from the fact that these completed L functions are entire by means of Hadamard product formulas, you can combine these two lemmas, basically in Zago's theorem, to come up with our conclusion. More, more or less, that's what you do it. That's what you do. Um, so you, this proves most of the cases. Infinitely many cases remained. Time is running out on me, so let me just say you have to work hard to, 
to come up with a different argument for the cases that remain. And thankfully, the computer, cal computer calculation in Sage covered the remaining cases. Great. So what is it I wanted to tell you today? Um, one, Manning's conjecture is true. It is true that for every new form, we've constructed for you a polynomial whose coefficients are sums of weighted moments of the critical values. That polynomial satisfies a functional equation and satisfies the Riemann hypothesis. Its values at negative integers, as demanded by Manin, has a nice generating function just like zeta of minus n. And those values uh, conjecture the, uh, they encode the Blockato context complex that I've defined for you using the Stirling numbers. And if you take limits in the level aspect, for new forms of fixed weight and fixed sign of the functional equation that converge to nice binomial coefficient type polynomials. And in the case of the sign of the functional equation minus, uh, they're converging to what are, what are these classical Earhart polynomials. Great. So I think it's a very interesting moment for us in, in number theory because usually you try to prove theorems about L functions one L value at a time, and all of these theorems are basically proven because you're, con you're considering all of the critical L values of, as a package at once. When you do that at once, these are polynomials that behave very, very well. Right, thank you. Thank you very much for your lectures. Uh, for your lecture. Are there any questions or remarks? Yeah, what is the period polynomial? Oh, yeah, many, um, which one? You want the normalized one or here? No, it was L, it was an expansion. It was LF1 minus M. Oh, that's, oh, that's that too. Oh. It's R sub M. Yeah, it's right here. They're the same, right? You integrate from. Well, what are the two binomial coefficients going on? Ah. Uh, I forgot. It's a, I'm moving forward or backwards? I'm moving forward. I need to go backwards. I don't remember where it was. I don't remember giving this talk. Uh, uh, well, you did. Ah. Uh, there. HK minus was with an Earhart polynomial out of HK plus. Oh, well, what words I? <laughs> no, no, you didn't have a formula for yeah. it. Yeah. So the, the answer is yes, but not, 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 not for a single polytope. It's, it's very unsatisfying. We were actually talking to Richard Stanley about that yesterday. So, um, <laughs> well, there's a feature of it. Yeah. Well, you're right. But it, yeah. So, strictly speaking, answer is no. But morally speaking, yes. If you're willing to not demand that this is an error error polynomial for fixed polytope for fixed k, yeah, that's not true. I have a quick comment or question. Yeah. Is, uh, is the anti-Earhart polynomial the same as the so-called manifold unique, or is possible that there exists another theory? Oh, there certainly could be another theory. There could certainly be another theory. Um, in, his pa in, in the paper that we use as motivation, he has numerics, which, which would be special, the first case of this. Yeah. Any other question? So then uh, we will have lunch now, and at 1.30, a photo outside of the building, and then 10 minutes later, the afternoon.